Thank you. Really pleased to be here. Those introductions all make me feel terribly old. Um, I've got an interesting gig today, because sometimes we go out and talk to people and we talk about you know, mobile, how big it is, and try and convince people to take it seriously. But I don't need to do that here, because you guys get that. You know about how important mobile is and how to make it work from there. We sometimes do speaking where we're talking more about the detail. I'm lucky we've got three experts later on today to go into real depth. So I'm going to talk about this idea about the potential of mobile um, and how the power and how we unleash it. Um, been doing this a long time, been in digital a long time. I've never been more excited than now with mobile because it's mass market. Millions of people are using the devices to change how they live their life. I think for the first time in a generation as marketers, we can get real competitive advantage. If you think back, if you think about your business, your competitors can pretty much copy your product. It's hard to really innovate in traditional marketing. Um, you know, they know about TV, etc. Pricing, distribution, all sort of fixed. The one thing you can do, though, if you get really, really good at this stuff, the chances are you've got competitive advantage because the other people in your market are not quite as on the ball. Lots of people still don't really get this stuff and do it properly from there. So we've had an early start. We've just had exhausting audience participation. So we're going to ease into this quite gently. I want to ask a question about this movie. Anyone seen this movie? Yeah. Great 1980s movie, shot in 1985. I've said 1985. Does anyone know what year the future was in that film? There's a prize for the person who gives the first answer. Okay, so I think down here is the first prize. The prize is a very cool Google Cardboard. Um, Facebook Oculus Rift, but you know, a fraction of the price. So back to the future. 2015, we're about six months away from it. So we're living in the future. If you think back to that movie, this was at the future. Fantastic. How much of that stuff has actually come true? Well, this doesn't look too dissimilar to Google Hangouts or FaceTime or Skype. Yeah, pretty commonplace now. Didn't even watch Modern Family. Modern Family on Monday this week in the UK, the whole episode was of someone's computer screen using FaceTime to jump from characters to characters. It's well worth looking at. It's very funny anyway, but it just shows just how this technology has taken root and people can live their lives with it from there. So we've seen that. Google Glass, anyone? Yeah. Maybe if it looked like this, it would be more successful. Um, but yeah, the idea of yeah, you, you've got virtual reality in a, a, a wearable yeah, was predicted then. So again, you know, pressing into um, the future. Some things didn't quite happen, though. The shoes were launched in a limited edition about two years ago, sold out straight away to sneaker um, fanatics. But if you remember, the key thing about them was they had automatic laces. And we're told that this year, Nike will launch some with automatic laces as well. How phenomenal is that? But things that didn't quite come true, wish I had. Any skateboarders here? The hoverboard. Now, $500,000 was raised on Kickstarter last year for a hoverboard. And Tony Hawks in the video demoed this hoverboard. So it looks like it's coming, although there is some debate over whether it's a true video or whatever from there. But maybe this Christmas you can get a hover hoverboard and you can do something, um, you know, do some, your half an hour to work um, goes down to 20 minutes. The other thing that didn't quite happen is the fashion tips. <laughs> so the double tie. We're talking about tights. Now, I live in Hackney, which is hipster paradise. There's guys who've seen bowler hats who are wearing seriously. So the, the two ties may well be a trend by um, October. We don't know yet. Um, but look at this. Well, one thing, wherever you go in the world, people haven't changed. The one thing that almost we're hardwired to, you see a picture of a cute baby and people smile. Anywhere in the world, you put a picture of a cute baby up, you get people on your side. But can anyone tell me what's special about this particular baby? It's wearing a wearable. This is a French startup which has launched um, a range of products where this baby grow has a device which is monitoring the baby. So breathing, temperature, where the nap is, where, et cetera, from there, and transmits that out. So it's one of those products that, you know, it's probably early stages yet, but you're seeing that wearables, that technology is starting to 
you know, come into different parts of our life. We do some work with a company that does baby food and talking about these types of products we think are going to sort of take off from there. But you think about those signals and those triggers that the baby gives up. So before the baby starts crying, you can see that, you know, it's too hot or it's, um, you know, the nappy is changing or whatever. You're getting those signals, those triggers. And if you think about your business, your business is throwing off that sort of data as well. Yeah, so there's a sort of a, a analogy here that you know, we can use those triggers, those signals, the business that throws off and use that to actually anticipate problems and solve problems before they turn into problems. Another prize here. Does anyone know what nomophobia is? A prize to this lady over here. It's on its way. So, have we all done that? That sort of wallet phone check you do before you go, like, where's my phone? I've done that. And you know, it's a real panic. Where, where's my phone gone? You know, it takes a moment to do that. Very high proportion of people have this sort of issue. Um, highest among sort of 18, 24 year olds, but 77% say their fear of not having their phone or not being able to charge their phone. So how many of you sat in a coffee shop or an airport and you're looking around and someone has already sat by the PowerPoint? You know, disastrous. You've got to go, you know, how am I going to charge my phone, keep it going from there? The whole reason that, that we're so excited, the reason we're called addictive is this behaviour is completely addictive. It's like a drug. People check their phones about 150 times a day. Which sounds preposterous, but if you think about you know, what you do, the amount of times you pick it up and look at it, to put it back down again, you know, it's an addictive behaviour. There's even some research that 75% so of people use their phones while in the bathroom. How they've done that research, I don't know. I'm not really interested, but you know, it's, sort of, it's addictive behaviour. It's part of the way people live their lives, and therefore it's a huge opportunity for us marketers. So let's think about why we're here today. Cash dollars, money. Did anyone heard of Mary Meeker? So Mary Meeker, an analyst uh, now with Kleiner Perkins, was at um, uh, Morgan Stanley, and she does this chart showing the amount where time is spent by medium and where money is invested. I think we all know that the chart with um, you know, mobile is over-invested in terms of time but under-invested in terms of money. And her calculations are there's $50 billion dollars in motion, moving from old media, where the amount of time spent has declined, but the money hasn't really changed, to new media like mobile, where the amount of time is much, much higher, but the money hasn't got there yet. And if you look at the digital chart in there, for a long time the digital one lagged as well, that's pretty much caught up. But $50 billion is moving around. And the reason why that's still moving around is largely, you know, it's our fault as marketers. Or it's our boss's fault or our board's fault because we're not making the investments in this that we should be doing. We know that we've picked the phone 150 times. We know that people are building fantastic businesses, but we're still spending money in some of the wrong places. So over today, and again, I think that we, guide, we know that, but we, you know, we're trying to give you ammunition and um, help you go back and make that case to keep pushing more money into mobile because it is a machine for making money. You can do really well from this. So what I'm going to talk about in the next 45 minutes is really pick up on some of the conversations we've had with the clients we talk to, CMOs, CEOs, about mobile, the issues they're facing, and some of the solutions we've found from there as well. We're going to talk about four pillars, which is the structure of the day. Um, we're going to talk about data and try and get you know, under the skin of that sort of cliche in some ways. We're going to talk about design, measurement, and testing. And we think that if you get those four things right, then you can unlock that competitive advantage. If you don't get those things, things right, you, know, you are leaving money on the table. You are at risk of somebody else doing better than you from there. So we're going to talk about it in sort of reasonably general terms, and then um, my colleagues over the afternoon will talk in a bit more detail from there. But to last prize for the moment, Moore's Law. Who can tell me what Moore's Law is? You've got to shout it out. Go on. Not quite. Any, any advance on that? Processing power doubles in 18 months. We've got about, about every two years, but you're right. You think about to, uh, we did some work. Price? Yeah, your price. <laughs> they're, they're rushing. Okay. 
Put your hand up so they know where it's going. Okay. So one of the things that, um, before I even did digital agencies, we worked for Compaq. And they came to us 20 years ago in the days of the information superhighway in the AOL wall garden. So look, we want to start selling computers to people at home. As you can't plan, I was going around the country talking to people about, would you buy a computer for your home? And the general view was, you know what? I don't want office equipment in my house. There's big, clunky things. I don't want to do control, delete, and all that. But eventually, the law of CD-ROMs and AOL persuaded people to start buying computers in the house. If you think about that computer 20 years ago now, compared to a modern mobile phone, it's completely powerless. You know, the advances we've had in the capability of the phones is phenomenal. You're 100 times smarter, this phone, than the Nokia you might have had in 2000. So that Moore's Law doubling is really important. Still continues to happen. So we're just at this, you know, we're not at the start, but there's still quite a long way to roll in this um, business as well. There's more um, innovation to come through as well. And I think that it's Alice in Wonder. You can choose to take the red pill or the blue pill. If you, if you don't take this stuff seriously, then really I do think you can go out of business. Somebody else in your sector will do better. But if you take the right pill and really get this stuff done properly, you can leap from your competition. You can get competitive advantage. So I won't go through winners and losers here in too much detail, but you know, slightly UK-centric, but a whole bunch of famous names that have just disappeared. HMB is still there in some sort of way, but had real problems. Nokia, the biggest um, phone manufacturer in the world. They don't make phones anymore. Kodak, the biggest camera company in the world. Kodak invented a digital camera. The technology on all your smartphones was invented by Kodak, and they very smartly sold the patents for $500 million, which at the time probably seemed like a really good deal. Had they got a dollar for every phone that runs on their patents, they'd be a very rich company, but they didn't do that. Um, Radio Shack didn't get e-commerce, partnered with Amazon to run, let them run the e-commerce part of their business. Amazon did that for two years and then said, OK, we're, chain, we're, we're finishing the contract, and Radio Shack went bust pretty soon afterwards. If you don't get this stuff right, big companies fail and disappear. And other companies do do very well. I mean, you know, Spotify, Apple, Amazon. Samsung, I think, has a question mark over it. You know, it's a really good company, but it's losing market share, and there's loads of interesting Chinese companies coming through from there. But these companies you know, are companies that use digital, use mobile, use data to really push their businesses forward. So one thing that I've been sort of stuck with for a long time the year of mobile. So 2009, I was very excited about mobile. I decided to leave my job at Mindshare and get into this space because I found that 300 million people bought an iPhone. And that was the same number of people who were on the internet at the height of the dot-com boom in 2000. So I thought, it's arrived. Fantastic. This is the sign it's going to take off. Didn't quite happen in 2009 or 2010 or 11 or 12 or 13. <laughs> sort of, it does, does anyone know what happened yesterday? The al algorithm changing? The Google algorithm changed, so it now rewards mobile optimized sites and penalizes those that haven't been optimized. So it's a big news item in the UK yesterday. You sort of feel like we're sort of getting there. But what we think, like to think about it is it's a decade of mobile. There is nothing significant in marketing or in business going to happen in the rest of this decade that isn't driven by mobile. We really think that those, you know, the things we're seeing now, that those tectonic plates are in place, are going to keep on moving from there. But in a way, the mobile thing, you now feel, well, it's slightly redundant in lots of ways because we get it, lots of people have got it. The thing for marketers to think about almost beyond there is a multi-device consumer. So we have a newsletter called Mobile Fix, and every time we write it, you almost feel like, I want to take mobile off because we talk about modern digital. All those businesses we talked about before, Spotify, Apple, etc., work across all platforms. They're mobile first, but what's interesting is how people are using it as part of lots of different devices. How many people have got... A, everyone's got a smartphone, OK? How many people have got a tablet that they use on a regular basis? OK? How many people have got a laptop they use on a regular basis? And a biggish screen TV? So we're all multi-device consumers. If you get caught up in, oh, let's put money into mobile, on its own, you're missing the point. You know, the very sort of er, best early adopters for mobile, if you go to Old Street in London, go to Berlin, go to Silicon Valley, all those guys who are living and breathing this stuff, when they start doing their work, they're sat in front of a laptop, usually. 
So it's still multi-device, even though the mobile is so important. The thing that's really interesting now is, yeah, yes, get mobile right, but think about mobile in the context of what everything else is being done as well. So that multi-device, we think, is really important. So 65% of the population use six or more devices on a regular basis. So that's a laptop at work, laptop at home, etc. So really big numbers using uh, you know, the majority of devices. And as we get into measurement and talk about things later on, you know, we know that you can see someone over here is doing something on mobile, someone's doing something on desktop. Connecting those two things together remains you know, the real challenge for us, I think. So we think that it's getting easier. We think it's getting better. Um, we think that Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon are part of the solution to this. So Google got interesting um, new tools coming out on a regular basis. Facebook have got Atlas, which is just launched, which is, you know, looks like solving cross-device. As with Amazon this week, they've got a very big sales force now focused on advertising on the Amazon um, platform. But their view of advertising isn't sort of building brand. It's actually it's point of sale for things that you sell on Amazon as well. So we've got people, you know, Apple moving that as well. These four big companies are shaping the marketplace to a large extent. We have this theory that um, if over coffee later we invent the smartest idea ever, the most brilliant business you've ever imagined, you end up selling it to Google or Apple or Facebook or maybe Amazon because they've got so much money and so much power, it's hard to see people driving biz important businesses outside of that. And there are some exceptions, obviously. But we think that you know, getting those four right is really important. And the advice we give to clients is if you've got... Google sorted, so you've got your search really well sorted, and you've got your display sorted. If you've got Facebook sorted, so you've got your organic reach, yeah, the best you can get it, but using that smartly. If you've got Apple, you've got the right devices, you know, you've got your apps, you're looking at your partnerships with them, and you know how you're listed on Amazon, then you're in a pretty good place. There's almost no need to go off and go to other people, other vendors. You can do quite well just with those four. Now, if you talk to Yahoo or Twitter, they'd argue with that, but the amount of opportunity within Google and Facebook and Apple and Amazon is so big, you almost like you know, you'll get to the end of the week on those before you get to anything else from there. So, really important to get that right, partly why you're here of today. But I want to talk about one thing. How many people have ordered an Apple Watch? Who's ordered a £10,000 gold one? We've sold out of those in China, seemingly. So the Apple Watch is really interesting. You know, being a big success, lots of people ordered it. The forecast like 25, 30 million units. How many, has anyone got a smartwatch on that isn't Apple Watch? One, two. So smartwatches haven't quite happened. Apple Watch, I think, is going to be really interesting. 25 million units is a great success, and Apple move into a different space. We're talking to a client. It's oh yeah, we're developing our app for the um, watch. Really? Oh, yeah, we've been working for three or four months now, got a whole team on it. So I've probably spent 100, 150 grand in terms of time of people building an app for the Apple Watch. It's debatable whether it's the right tool for them. But even so, 25 million people, you can't get an ROI on that. You just do it for PR purposes. And this is a client who hasn't got a great mobile site, who hasn't got a great mobile app, but they're using their time and effort and money to focus on the gimmick. And I think that one of the problems we have with mobile in particular and technology, that everyone's caught up on the next thing, the new, new thing. So we've got people in London who are spending time doing presentations on Oculus Rift. Fantastic. I'm sure it's going to be wonderful. By the time it gets enough numbers to really be able to move your market and sell products or make you money from there, it's two or three years out. You know, there's people spending time on the new, new thing rather than you know, plain old boring mobile, which is 35 million people in the UK 150 million people across Europe have got that in their, phone, in their hands and using it. So that sometimes you can get the wrong focus. So we'd argue it's interesting to get an Apple Watch, interesting to see what happens with it. It's not a good use of money in the short term unless you can be sure of getting a TechCrunch headline, and that's what you know, affects your, um, your CEO. So let's talk about the first pillar in data. So big data, the idea of, you know, we have a Venn diagram. You know, people who talk about big data, people who know about big data, there's not an awful lot of crossover. It's become one of those cliches that everyone talks about it. And actually, you know, the real distinction isn't big data. It's first-party data and third-party data. 
It's the data you've got thrown up from your business. Remember we talked about the baby does triggers, those signals, what you learn from looking at your Google Analytics, what's working, what isn't working, looking at your conversion, looking at what's happening on your site, etc. That's first party data. And the third party data is what you can go out and get from somebody else. So we're very focused on programmatic at the moment, and the ability to find really disparate data sources and use that in targeting is really interesting. Lots of potential there. But those are the two things we think are really interesting, first party and third party. So there's a great quote. Let me just get this exact quote. A guy called Tom Goodwin, who's um, at Havas, um, which is one of the big ad agencies, I'll quit it. So Uber doesn't own any hotel rooms. Facebook publishes huge amounts of... Let me, I'm going to find the exact quote. I'm not going to do it justice. Bear with me one second. Paper's useless, isn't it? Here we go. Here we go. Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. And Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. Those are data companies. They exist and have grown because they're using data to work, you know, to create scale and create value for people. So Uber has 20,000 employees in the Bay Area alone. 20,000 people there. Alibaba, which is more valuable than Amazon, only 5% of this revenue comes from outside China right now. They want that to go to 50. So these companies really making big changes, using data to really drive their businesses, but they're not um, traditional business in the sense that we, you know, how we've come to um, think about them. This is, um, does anyone know CityMapper? CityMapper, um, startup based in London. They're in London, San Francisco. I think they're in Berlin now. They've created a fantastic business, really highly valued, loved by people. It was one of the top um, iPhone apps last year in um, the UK. It uses someone else's data to help you get around London. All the data comes from TfL, Transport for London, publish an API of all their data, of when the next bus is due, how tubes are running, with the tube maps, and they've built a fantastic business based on other people's data, third-party data. They've got a competitor called Move It that's um, got an investment of £33 million, which values it at um, £350 million. So using other people's data, third-party data, to actually create real value. So again, thinking about this idea of first-party data and third-party data, what have you got and what can you get from someone else? What exists out there? More and more companies have got APIs. Having somebody in your business who understands the potential of an API and how to use those, we think is a really sound investment these days, understanding it really well. The danger, obviously, though, is you rely on other people's data, you kind of run into problems. So um, there's an interesting company, DataSift, which actually has a strong business taking Twitter data and packaging it up and selling it onto other people. Um, got a f an email last Friday telling Twitter's withdrawing their access to the data. So you can have a business that's doing very well and someone can take those things away when you're relying on other people's data. But the idea of using data, we think, is really powerful. The idea of your own data um, and what you've got, I think people underestimate sometimes just what, what potential they've actually got there. CRM is one of the things that's slightly... Not out of fashion, it's slightly... It's still important. In lots of cases, you talk to people about CRM, it's what's being used to send out you know, emails, not that well targeted in lots of cases. But the idea you've got a database of access, of knowledge about your users, we think is really powerful, really an interesting thing to have. And the more you can do with that and make that richer, the better. You know, so collecting information about your customers, you know, permission-based, tracking what they do, and really building out strong data, we think has really good potential. And when you talk to people, because of the email um, you know, use case, it tends to get compartmentalized off to one side. Um, when we're talking to people about mobile, emails are sort of slightly you know, um, poor relation. But what we're starting to see now is there are great tools to take that information and take it into different places. So Google launched, announced, rumored to announce last week that they've got a custom audiences tool. So anyone know Facebook custom audiences? 
So here you have your Facebook. You can take a list of people from your CRM database, give it to Facebook, and they, they will then they'll charge you for this, obviously. Um, but they'll, you, know, you can go out and target those people within Facebook. So we were talking to um, a retailer of baby products. You know, why would we do that? We can talk to people for free. They're getting a 9% open rate. Actually taking the data, running it in Facebook, gives you a way of reactivating your communication with those people. Facebook and Twitter and Google can also take that and look for lookalikes. So you've got these people signed up with you. What can you do to take that data forward and do more with it and find more people from there? So it's a great tool for you know, getting more value from your existing customers. It's a great tool also for finding people who are similar to the existing customers. Let's talk about design. Um, there's another quote we saw on Twitter yesterday. Design used to be the stuff you sprinkle on top of the cake to make it look nice, but now it's the flour you use to bake the cake. I think we've seen the transition that design was about it being pretty, it's about look and feel, and we've now got recognition that design is actually a fundamental of you know, how you put together a great service, how you engage customers, how you really do something really powerful with it from there. One of my favorite examples, so Apple you know, nailed design. If you read interviews with Jonathan Ives, you know, he totally gets design. Every part of their business you know, reflects that. My favorite thing is, you know when you buy the iPhone, you go to the most fantastic retail store, you get in that lovely box, you take it out, it works straight away. They give you a little silver key, it's about an inch long, and it's just for pressing the button to get your SIM card out. And then you throw it away. Because you never, you, no point in keeping it. But Apple know that in the process of putting your phone, at some point, you need to change the SIM card. And they know that it would spoil the whole experience if you have to scrabble around looking for a paper clip. So they give you, they design the service, they give you a beautiful stainless steel pin that allows you to open the SIM card. That's good design, thinking through the whole process and how you can make it easy for people to, to make it work. I'm going to talk about um, some examples. This is um, Kickstarter. It's really interesting. If you think about navigation around an app, it's a search problem. I want to get to where I want to get to quite quickly and find it. Um, over this afternoon, you're going to hear a bit about the hamburger menu, the idea that um, you, know, you can actually relegate all that nasty navigation off to somewhere else with a little hamburger menu. I'll show you in a second. Um, but this was something really from Kickstarter. So they've given you two choices. So that's staff picks, and the little arrow there tells everybody, you know what, I can press that and see a range of other things from there. And I can sort them by a range of things from there. And sort by magic is, is the default, which is a lovely sort of way of kickstarting getting the brand over really quickly. You're going to go in there and explore and look for these wonderful ideas. The fantastic hoverboard that may well be true. Um, but the navigation tool, it works incredibly well, because straight away I can find what I'm looking for, I can see what the parameters are, and jump through it really quickly. You can change it around and do it in different ways. But an app, you've got a couple of minutes maximum to get somebody to engage with you. You've downloaded that app. The stats are people download an app quite infrequently, that lots of apps get used four or five times and never used again. So how many of you us have got apps on the last screen of their iPhone or their Android? We've got no idea what they are. They've got a badly designed icon. We can't remember what they download what they were, we can't be able to have a look and find out. They're just in the graveyard now. We haven't got time to delete them. Getting the design right of all those factors, that, you know, the icon in the first place, then when you get into it very clearly, making it, you can see what you're meant to be doing and how to find your way around, and you can solve that problem you downloaded the app for. This is um, Trivago, which is um, a hotel um, app based out of Berlin. And Good demonstration, what people are starting to do now is using data and understanding to start anticipating use cases. Do you think about Google? Google gives you a little box in the middle, type in there whatever you want, and we'll take you to it from there. This is the opposite end of that. We're going to make some assumptions. So when you open up Trivago, wherever you are, it assumes that you want a hotel close to where you're stood right now, it uses your location, for that night, for one person you know, in a single room, because it's for business people. The, you know, the main use case, I'm in Dublin, I'm not going to make my flight back, I need a hotel room, pull out the app, and it pull, gives me that information straight away. So the first page is populated based on those assumptions. Now, it's very easy to go and change those. I can click a button, change the double room. I can sort it in lots of different ways. So I can change the price and move the price around. 
I can click on the star ratings. I can click on customer reviews. Quite why anyone would ever choose to search a hotel for hotels that people really don't like. Down below, you can choose the distance. Down below, you can scroll down, and it has got a pool or a spa, etc. from there. So that's great design solving a problem for you, but making some assumptions straight away. And just like in Google, all of the revenue, a large portion of the revenue of the hotel sites is on that first page. Most people don't go beyond that first page because, hey, I've got 10 hotels within you know, a mile and a half of where I am with availability at the right sort of price point. I'm going to book one of those from there. So design is anticipating what people are looking for and solving that problem for them. Making the user work less is a primary part of design. You know, asking yourself those tough questions, what do we need to have here? What shouldn't we have here? So we want to ask, find out about a pool. We can put that down the page. If someone wants to find the pool, they'll scroll down to find it from there. So asking those tough questions, back to the Apple Watch. We're talking to um, the guys at CityMapper about the Apple Watch. So the idea of a navigation tool around town on a watch sort of makes sense. I can imagine that getting turn-by-turn -turn instructions to walk to that hotel on my, phone would be, on my wrist would be quite useful. But they've agonized over that process of what you take away from the app experience to make you work on the phone. And they agonized and argued and looked for data and tested lots of things. You can't test on the watch because it doesn't exist. So how do you build in some sort of surrogate for that testing? And all the time you're taking away. And if you think about the process of mobile, you know, the design journey is all thinking about, OK, we've got a desktop. When we started building websites in 1995, little 640 screen. As time's gone on, we've got bigger screens. So you can expand the top navigation to have more and more things on that top menu bar. You know, we've got lazy, everything's on there from there. When you come to mobile, you're making tough decisions. What do I need to take away? What do I need to hide more? What has to be given priority on a mobile phone? Um, one of the things we talk a lot about, and I think we're going to get into it a little bit later with Craig, perhaps, responsive design. So the idea of designing a website which will you know, automatically adjust to whatever device it's on, fantastic. Works really well. But if you don't have those tough decisions about what's important on a phone versus a tablet, you end up still with quite a lot of clutter. And actually, I, can't have, you know, I can have everything on my website, I'll have everything on my app, but I'm going to make some choice about what goes at the top and what goes at the bottom. There's hard decisions. Design's about making those hard decisions and then executing it in a way that's you know, very pleasing to the eye and works. So, search, so this is the top here. Next to the search bar, that little sort of three lines, that's a hamburger menu. Very fashionable amongst UX now. It's great because suddenly, OK, I can do that. Solves all the problems. The only trouble is no one told the general public that's a menu. <laughs> um, so actually, if you find that, we might cover it later, if you put menu against that, your usage of it just you know, shoots up, because, oh, that's a menu. You know, and you can make these lovely little assumptions. Oh, everyone will know that's um, you know, what it means. It doesn't really work in that way. The other thing, let's search, again, this idea. You know, you're trying to solve the problem. You've made those decisions about, you know, with your service. You, you have to reduce things down. Search is still really important. Putting search front and center is really important to help people find their way around. The way you've done navigation, the way you've sorted your menu may not solve their particular problem. So making it very easy, they can type search and do something is really important. But getting search right is still a challenge. We've all been spoiled by Google, because I can type gobbledygook into Google now, and it'll actually sense what I'm, what I'm, what I'm thinking of. It'll you know, look at spelling mistakes, it'll look at past history, it'll solve that problem for me. Lots of people in apps don't have that same you know, um, design philosophy there. IBM, um, you can choose your language, etc. But they can anticipate, you know, they look at smart CTY. Oh, I think he's looking for smart city. And they give you the results to do that. So little things like making search work hard makes loads of sense. If you're an e-commerce company and someone's searching for a pair of shoes or whatever, and you don't, you, know, you don't help them by recognizing typos, etc., you lose them to go somewhere else. If you solve those problems with design, it works incredibly well. <clears throat> the whole login, you know, whether you should get someone to log in on a mobile phone, you know, ideally you should get someone to log in on a different device because it's easy to do that. But again, consumers haven't got that memo. They still want to log in on mobile devices sometimes. So how do you make that work really well? Interesting stuff that's starting to happen. There's a couple of companies now 
from payments, the one thing that's really, you know, a lot of friction causes problems, typing in a 16-digit um, credit card number is a hassle. Then you're getting that right is really difficult. You can take a picture of your card because phones have got cameras in, and OCR can read those numbers and populate it for you. So the sort of solution starting to come through now where people are using technology to solve problems. Why should I have to type in my numbers in there where I can take a picture of the card, it's automatically uploaded and done from there. It's still secure because I still have to turn the card over and have the, um, the uh, three-digit um, number on there to actually prove I've got the card in my um, possession. So this is you know, some of the things here. Um, Nike is quite interesting. You know, they give you the option to get password help to send it back. They used to be very helpful here because they used to tell you when your password wasn't right, they give you a password hint that it has to be eight digits, has to include capital letters, has to include some numbers, etc. from there, which is great customer service. It's not great for security. You say, oh, OK, how do I hack into my friend's Nike account and buy those Back to the Future trainers with the automatic laces? So there's a tension between solving a problem and security. And they're all design issues, thinking those things through. You're going to hear quite a lot about it as we go through the day, because I, we find people, we're having a conversation with somebody in um, a boardroom, and we used to talk quite a lot about the number of people who've got mobile site versus haven't. And there's a stat from the IAB about two years ago, 80% of top 100 brands didn't have a mobile site, which we thought was this dreadful indictment. You go around and talk to people about that. Do you know 80%, you know, you're one of those 80%. And everyone, oh, it's not just me then. And sort of relaxed about it a little bit. We find that people quite often, you know, haven't experienced their website on their mobile phone. They've got an iPhone and they've got Netflix on it and they're doing all the things for it. They've never bothered to go look at their site from there and work out, actually, it's a terrible experience. So that design aesthetic just, you know, is really important. Getting people to understand how you solve those problems is really important. Getting the people at the top to understand that this is a problem is really important as well. So one of the things we think is going to be quite important, um, payments. So Google Wallet, Apple Pay, etc. We mentioned the credit card issue before. It's still something. So there are quite big shifts going on and happening uh, over the um, coming months and years which are going to have an impact on you know, how you do business and make it work from there. Payments is really interesting. This is a really interesting chart, which I just put in because everybody here knows that actually if you compare your desktop with your mobile, the figures don't stack up. The conversion's not as good. Traffic might be there, but people don't convert. You don't make as much money from there. And the general sort of view, oh, well, that's just the way it is. So some figures, so this is a US smartphone funnel. On average, people you know, look at three products, 10% put them in the basket, 8% purchase. So it's not fantastic, 2.4% conversion rate. But in Japan, people look at nine products per user, small number in the basket, purchase 18%, almost 10% conversion rate. So there's not some magic that can be done. It's just that actually Japan is a more sophisticated market where they've been buying stuff on mobile for longer because they got a very vibrant you know, e -com M commerce um, marketplace even before the iPhone turned up from there. So you've just got that familiarity with it. And people there build sites which allow people to find what they're looking for and add it to a basket and pay for it and check out really, really well. So our objective is how do we get to that in the rest of the world? It's just a case of great design and we'll talk about data, etc. as we go through that. But imagine going to your boss and hey, We've done some work. We've got a 400% increase in conversion rates. OK. Yeah, it's possible. I want to talk one other thing. Um, who uses Google Now? Does everyone know about Google Now is a glimpse of the future. Google Now is a fantastic service that uses what it knows about you, data, um, to deliver a fantastic, useful service. So this morning, when I got up at crack at 4.45, Picked up my phone, an alert from Google now at 3 o'clock saying you need to leave now to get to the airport for two hours before your flight. It knows where I am. 
It knows I've got a flight leaving to the airport at 6.45. It knows you should really be there two hours beforehand. It knows how long it takes to get there and it delivers that information to me. It's a fantastic service. Really recommend you go play with it. But the thing that's interesting from a design point of view is the information they give is on carbs. So that they're atomizing the content they give into individual carbs. So Google now do it. Pinterest do it, Twitter starting to do it. If you look at Facebook posts, they're cards as well. This idea, if you atomize content, it makes it easy to share with different people. So the idea of taking content and packaging it into small cards, we think is going to be a really interesting sort of metaphor or um, a, a design practice going forward. Um, and if we think about notifications, we haven't got time to get into notifications today. The idea of notifications and cards together, you're moving from a world where I need to go to an app to do something to an app giving me some information at the right point with, you know, to make it a service for me. So we're changing that sort of push and pull sort of model in some ways. Well, I'm going to pull a, pillar three, which is measurement. I was talking to a um, VC company, and he says, I hate when people come and pitch with us because they always give us a cost per acquisition figure. And I always get really annoyed when we have a big argument because a cost per acquisition figure is always an average. There's a whole perils of average. And so what they normally find is, in some cases, um, you know, you've got tablet and mobile smartphone information together, packaged in the mobile, and that doesn't really make an awful lot of sense. You've got lots of things where sometimes you've got, you know, organic um, acquisition tools where just get loads of people turn up at the website and sign up. It's fantastic. It's free, and we've got paid ones, which is great. Except you can't scale organic in the way you can scale. Um, uh, paid for. So you, you've got to be careful not to lose you know, the meaning by getting you know, the, you, not using the data in the right way. And we'll get some real good information, good um, learnings from that as we move through today. But there's a guy called Avinash Kashuk, I can't, who's a Google um, guru, I'll probably mispronounce his name, but he's a fantastic guy, writes a great blog about measurement analytics, and it's incredibly readable. His whole point is there's no point in having all this great stuff in analytics and measurement if it can't be used by everybody. And the example he put up about um, two months ago, this is the dashboard of the Indianapolis Museum of Art. It's a dashboard that everybody sees from the top of the organisation right the way down of the key information. So in here it's got um, number of artworks on view, the electricity being used, member visits, average time on website, number of third graders from the school who have been there, how many plants they've planted. So, you know, what is the information that we care about in our organisation and let's make that really available? And I suspect that a lot of you, like me, have got you know, dashboards with hundreds of bits of information, which is all really, really important. And we sometimes we, we don't, can't see the wood for the trees. We haven't got the stuff that's really important pulled out. So I think there's a, you know, the learnings we get from today is think about what really matters and make sure you're sharing that with other people in your organisation. So we did some work with a couple of people, and we have this idea of trying to get one headline metric to get everyone behind. So OK is a um, celebrity-driven magazine in the UK, um, you know, print magazine. They got a mobile web, they got a desktop website where 70% of the traffic was mobile. A huge proportion coming from Twitter. The vast majority were coming in, looking at one story, and going away again. So the work we did, for them, we came with this idea, we've got to make the experience much more um, glossy, much more satisfying that you get to the stories really quickly. But our headline metric is, let's get one more page. Did we get every user to one more page, we suddenly made like a 40% increase in their ad revenue. So we haven't got there yet, but we're moving towards that. The idea was you'd come in, have a really rich stream of um, lots of pictures of people, I've got no idea who they are, um, but you click through the story, find those people, you've done two pages straight away. and broken that sort of model um, of, you know, in and out again from there. And one thing on here, which is the design factor. We think when you're designing something, you should reward the investment someone's made. Someone's got a brand new iPhone 6 that does 4G. They've got a great Wi-Fi net connection. Give them a fantastic experience. Give them beautiful pictures that look great on a fantastic screen and really, you know, reward that investment in kits, but have sort of lazy loading and all those things you can do to, if it's a not so good um, experience, if it's a poor um, 3G connection, you give them something different from there. But always like default where possible to the best possible experience from there. This is um, a charity called Plan, you know, fantastic charity. Suddenly found that um, their desktop 
site was getting 40% of the traffic was coming from mobile devices, which is fantastic. People were still, still pinching and zooming, finding their way around, but nobody was donating. It was just too hard to donate on their site. So we built a mobile site and spent a lot of time looking at um, you know, how we could make that funnel better. And the metric we used there was just one more donation. That you know, everybody would try and we get a donation from those people. And again, giving lots of options, allowing people to change. But default, the ideal for plan is to get someone to sign up for a regular direct debit. A single payment's great, but actually if you can get someone to give a direct debit, over the lifetime value is much, much better. So the default was we're going to sponsor a child with a regular monthly gift, and we put £15 in. £20 is there as a higher one, but one of the interesting things we finally talked to people, the fact that you put 15 rather than 20 makes it feel like I'm still making a good donation, but I'm not spending too much money from there. So playing around with people's psychology to some extent and buy direct debits. And we added PayPal to that because they hadn't used PayPal in the past, and you find that lots of people on mobile will happily pay from PayPal, but not with the credit card. <coughs> so... I'm not going to really touch on this in too much detail because we're going to get into it as we go through the afternoon, but the whole idea of the A word, the attribution word, that we, it's a burden that we have to bear as digital marketers. Works a lot in traditional marketing. No one's ever asked what's the attribution model for a TV commercial. Money gets spent on television without any real metrics behind it. You know, my favourite um, outdoor advertising now costs the same did 10 years ago. If you want to buy a poster on Oxford Street, on the Main Street in Dublin, the cost hasn't really changed, but the audience now walking past now, compared to 10 years ago, is peering at their screen, so the attention has disappeared from there. But on digital, we have to deal with the attribution word. Um, understanding how you do that properly is really you know, the key to everything, I think. The understanding how you can really push it through and make it work. And going back to that point we made before, it's about cross-screen you know, mm -hmm. behaviour. The television does work and it's really effective at getting people to be aware of your product and maybe even driving traffic to your website or maybe to your app, but understanding how those things work together and having a model which allows you to really take account of that is really important. Because it might be that some people are under-investing in television. There's an interesting um, trend, or it's starting to happen now, if you talk to lots of app developers, Facebook isn't working that well in terms of downloads anymore because so many more advertisers are spending money on Facebook, the cost of app downloads is increasing, and people have been thinking about going back to traditional media and running it on television. So you know, understanding how you make all the things fit together is really important. It's not that one's right and one's wrong, it's how you actually orchestrate those to make it work really well. And it's about making smart decisions, understanding what you need to do, what you don't need to do, you know, how you pull that together. Just on the final thing, there's a great quote, you know, I think it's Albert Einstein, not everything that matters can be measured, not everything that measures can, matters. And we can get too caught up in that from there. Um, one thing that's worth just bearing in mind here, we think that looking at brand metrics is really important. Again, if you think about your colleagues who work on traditional media, the main thing they're thinking about is brand metrics. Does the stuff we're doing above the line influence purchase decision, awareness, etc.? Yeah. Making sure that we measure that in digital, we think, is really important. There's more and more people now providing really good tools to do that. The UK company, which will pre-test a campaign. You can run a mobile campaign, and they can run you know, programmatic buy for $2,000 and pre-test a campaign before you press a button and spend properly on that. And we do think that idea that you'll only spend money on things you know work really well is going to be really important. Obviously... In the world of where we're measuring clicks and conversions, we know what's working, what isn't working. Looking at the brand effect of that as well, we think is going to be very significant. I'm not going to spend money on a campaign until I know this work is going to you know, move 10 points on purchase intent. And if it doesn't, I'll go back and rework the campaign. So we're getting to a world where technology can make creative better. That using data to look at brand metrics can really make that work. Dollar bills. It's all about dollar bills. So let's talk about testing. I'm not going to get into this in too much detail because Craig's going to talk about it, and he is the don of testing. Um, but one thing that is really important, you know, we know you've all seen this. There's loads of examples. Little changes can make a big difference. The thing that I'd say, and I think you know, it's going to be emphasised here, e-consultancy ran a report, I think, last week. The average client is doing like five or six tests at any one time. Hooray, yeah. It's not enough. You can't find out enough if you're doing five or six tests. And they talk about your know, smart companies running hundreds of tests at a time. 
Now, you need to be structured. You need to be knowing what you're testing for, being very methodical and rigorous about how you're doing that. But you should be testing lots and lots of things. If you're not testing stuff, you're not learning. If you're not learning, you're missing out some opportunities from there. But no one wants the, the idea of failure and things that don't go wrong. We talk to people about agile and about testing and learning. Everything's great until you get to the point where, what well, things might not work. We're going to spend some money on something, it might not work. And people are nervous about that. Um, so the art is how do you actually test things in a way that's as cheap and as quickly as possible? So the whole agile idea of minimum viable product, of you come up with an idea, you build some code, you measure it, you use the data and you learn. It's a really important thing to do. I think we know about that. I want to talk about something that you might not know quite as much about. Pre-typing. So Alberto Savoia used to work for Google. He has the world's best job title. He was innovation agitator. So imagine wandering around bothering people. But his whole thing was, how do we actually find ways of measuring, what, you know, working out what's a good thing to do as quickly and as cheaply as possible? And the book's great. It's a free book, I think. You find it on um, Google, is it? This is a picture of the Palm Pilot. Did anyone have a Palm Pilot? So it's a precursor to the smartphone. It's only those old people that remember it. By the Palm Pilot, it's a really interesting little device that, you know, acted as a personal assistant. You had your diary in there, had your contacts in there. You know, you could connect it to the internet in a strange sort of way later on. You had a stylus or whatever. But the guy who invented it came up with the idea, found a piece of wood inside of a cigarette packet and drew on the front what would be on a Palm Pilot. He put it in his top pocket and for six months he walked around with that and every, just tried to work out how many times would I pull this out? When would it be useful to do? So he taught himself how it, the product would be used by using a piece of wood. Two of the quick examples. Um, we had a client come to us, got a good mobile site, want to build an iPhone app. Really? What's it going to do? Well, it's going to do this. Yeah. Why do you want to build it? I think it's going to be a really good idea. So we persuaded them that rather than start build and write a check for 40, 50,000 pounds to build it, we put a page on their mobile website that we're launching an app. It does all these fantastic things. If you'd like to be a beta tester, sign up here. Give your email address and we'll be back in touch. And we counted how many people signed up for that. and It wasn't very many. And so it proved, OK, no one wants your app. You know, for the sake of paid, uh, coding one page, we'd worked out it wasn't worth spending 40, 50 grand without a much better idea of what it wants to do from there. So that idea of using Google AdWords to find an audience, a single page, sign up for email, you know, is a really interesting case. And my favorite, I can't work out if it's true or not, I don't really care, but McDonald's were launching McDonald's meatballs in the southern United States. So they rolled that out across loads of their stores, they put the equipment in to make the meatballs, they put in all the merchandising, all the information, promoting it. Dismal failure. Didn't really happen. They withdrew after six months. This guy's point was, all you do is you just go on the menu and you add McDonald's meatballs, $5.99, and a nice picture of them. And when someone says, oh, can I have the meatballs? We haven't launched them yet, but here's a free voucher. The moment we launch them, you can get one for free. You just count how many vouchers you give out, and you've straight away worked out what demand is for your product. So the book's full of great examples of things to do to test stuff as quickly and cheaply as possible. And I think that you know, thinking, how can you test something, code something you know, in a day, test it, work out what happens, learn really quickly, really cheaply, and move on from there. And I love that um, his manifesto, innovators beat ideas, pre-to-types beat product, product types, building beats talking, simplicity beats features, now beats later, commitments beats co committed, and data beats opinions. There's a great story I was told when Marissa Meyer went to Yahoo. They're talking about some things trying to change an app. And she said, look, have we got some data on this? Because I'll use the data. If we haven't got the data, we're going to use one opinion, mine. Uh, having the data is really important. It's a really interesting book. You know, think about that, how you could use that in your business do things cheaply and quickly, move on from there. So I want to talk really quickly about one person we think does this really well. So here's a company that isn't a tech company, isn't sort of filled with MBAs. You know, it's, just, um, you know, it's a company that does this stuff incredibly well at scale, <coughs> seeing real results from taking stuff really seriously. It's a coffee company. Most people work there on minimum wage. It's global, and they use mobile and 
digital incredibly well. I think they're rubbish at coffee. They're really good at this stuff, personal taste. So they've got a really good app. I'm going to go through it quite quickly. 2.1 million transactions a week. And this was a killer chart for me. So 15% of all their sales go through the Starbucks mobile app. So pretty phenomenal. In 2012, last year we've seen data for $500 million was spent on mobile payments in the United States. 90% was through Starbucks. You know, they own mobile payments because they solve the problem. That having the, you know, your um, app on your phone with some money loaded in there helps you get served a little bit quicker, helps you keep your loyalty points from there. They do quite a lot around um, media, you get a free song from iTunes, etc. You know, how many people have got those little card, cardboard bits of paper you get from a coffee shop with stamps on them? All got dozens of them. That's a big fraud problem for a coffee shop. Because, of course, you know, someone hands in one of those and the coffee's been sold and you haven't got any money for it. You know, it's quite easy for somebody just to stamp one themselves. So if you look at a cost of coffee or whatever, they worry their staff are you know, maybe bending the rules a little bit. This gets around it by using technology to solve the problem. Again, great design. Yes, you can find the store. In-store purchases, you can add a tip. They found that the tipping went up because it's easier to make a tip rather than looking for the change. Um, people get made more tips from it as well. The company we're working with doing responsive advertising, they're very keen, Starbucks are very keen to test out new formats for advertising. So this is something we're testing for them where you can find local stores, etc. They've even bought a company um, which allows you to order on mobile. So the idea is, you know, you go to a coffee shop now, you get in the queue, someone shouts at you for your name, etc. You'll be able to order from your app. So I want a tall caramel macchiato, da 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 da. You can order it from your phone. And they've bought a company of land to do that. But they've also invested in beacons. So the beacons will recognise when you turn up at the store. Because, of course, if I order the coffee, I'm here in Dublin in Google, I order the coffee, by the time I get it, it might be cold. They only start making it when the beacon tells you that you've walked into the store. So looking at technology which solves problems for them, which makes their consumer experience better, but makes it easier for their staff. And they've talked about they've saved hundreds of thousands of hours of staff time by the mobile taking the payment rather than taking cash, etc. from there. They're also very good at partnerships. So back to that point about Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, loads of people haven't really worked out what Passbook's about. Starbucks, very quick to participate. So if you've got a Starbucks app, you can, you, know, you can use Passbooks as well. With Apple Pay, they're a, primary, they're a launch partner for Apple Pay. But you can use Apple Pay to top up the Starbucks app. You can't use it to pay in store. So they've worked out what's the best way to collaborate and make some sense. So we sort of started talking about the future. What's next? I've got no idea what's next. <laughs> Nobody knows anything. Tomorrow, someone will launch something that takes, <coughs> blows up, you know, takes our breath away. Think back 10 years ago, 2005. So Facebook is only available in about a dozen US schools. The biggest social network is, My, uh, is MySpace, which Rupert Murdoch just bought for $950 million. He sold it for Justin Timber, to Justin Timberlake for $26 million about five years later. Google have just bought YouTube. The Twitter team are still working on podcasting at Odeo. They haven't even got to thinking about Twitter just yet. And the nearest thing you get to a smartphone was the Palm Trio, which is the extension of the Palm Pilot we talked about before. So Palm Trio, I had one, it was great, you could get your emails on it, just, you know, just before the BlackBerry, yeah, but it was really clunky. So even just 10 years ago, the, la the landscape was completely different to what we expect now. So in 10 years' time, it would be completely different again. You know, the guys who made the film were pretty good at predicting the future, I'm not going to take that call on. What I would say, though, is that whatever you're going to do, try and build... These four things are going to be really important. That how you use your data, how you use design, the measurement and, and the testing are going to be fundamental. If you get that right, it means when someone turns up with something new like Apple Watch or Oculus Rift or whatever they're going to invent next, you can sort of look at it and think, OK, I can make sense of this because I'm using data. I know how my design works, etc. If you get those things right, you've got a chance of succeeding. If you don't use those things, then I think you're going to be the Nokia or the Kodak or the um, you know, other people who have fallen by the wayside. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.